Today, prepare to batten down the hatches. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to these posts covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Well, tugs and diggers have so far failed to dislodge a massive container ship stuck in the Suez Canal, which happened on Wednesday. And that increases the chance of prolonged delays in what is arguably the world's most important waterway. Dredgers are still trying to loosen the vessel before any attempt to pull it out. The ship's manager said, It's taxing to even grasp how big this ship is. It's about a quarter of a mile long. That's 400 metres. And it's weighing in 200,000 metric tonnes. Its sheer size is overwhelming the efforts to dig it out. A huge yellow excavator itself, about twice as tall as its driver, looked like a child's toy parked next to the ship's bulking bow. The situation has gotten so desperate that an elite salvage squad is due to arrive to work on prizing the ever given from the bank of the canal, where it's blocking ocean-going carriers that haul everything from oil to consumer goods. Still, the best chance of freeing the ship may not come until Sunday or Monday, when the tide will reach a peak, according to Nick Sloan, the salvage master responsible for refloating the Costa Concorda, the cruise ship that capsized on the coast of Italy in 2012. Sloan works as the senior salvage master for Fort Lauderdale, Florida-based Resolve Marine Group. Around 12% of global trade goes through the canal, making it so strategic that world powers have fought over the waterways since it was completed in 1869. For now, all that traffic is backed up, with the ever given a ground in the southern part of the canal, creating another setback for global supply chains already strained by the e-commerce boom linked to the pandemic. The Suez Canal blockage comes at a particularly unhelpful time, said Greg Nola, European editor of GOC Group, which is part of IMS Market Limited. Even a two-day delay would further add to the supply chain disruption, slowing the delivery of cargo to businesses around the UK and Europe. The incident began on Tuesday when strong winds blasted through the region and kicked up sands along the banks of the 120-mile-long canal, which connects the Mediterranean in the north with the Red Sea in the south. The waterway is narrow, less than 675 feet wide or 205 metres in some places, and it can be difficult to navigate when there's poor visibility. But Ever Given stayed its course through the canal on its way to Rotterdam from China as gusts that reached as high as 46 miles an hour swept up dust around it. The crew lost control of the ship and it careened sideways into a sandy embankment, blocking nearly the entirety of the channel. It's still in the same position as when it rang aground, according to Inchcape. Two canal pilots were on board when the ship went aground at around 5.40am. The ship's last known speed was 13.5 knots at about 5.30am. At the heart of all this is the ship's massive scale. Container vessels have nearly doubled in size in the past decade as global trade expanded, making the job of moving such ships much harder when they get stuck. Even while key routes, including the Suez Canal, have been widened and deepened over the years to accommodate the mega-sized vessels, the work to dig them out after they get stuck takes enormous power. The struggle to dislodge the ship is now falling to SMIT Salvage, a legendary Dutch firm whose employees parachute themselves from one ship wrecking to the next, saving vessels often during violent storms. This ship is so heavy that, that the salve doors may have to lighten it by removing things like the ballast water, which helps keep ships steady when they're at sea. Fuel can also be unloaded. The Suez Canal Authority hasn't commented on the work or given any indication of when traffic could resume, and the canal is among the most trafficked waterways in the world, used by tankers shipping crude oil from the Middle East to Europe and North America, as well as in the opposite direction. On Wednesday, 185 vessels, mostly bulk carriers, container ships and oil or chemical tankers, were waiting to cross the canal according to shipping data compiled by Bloomberg. The blockage highlights a major risk faced by the shipping industry as more and more ships transit maritime choke points, including the Suez, Panama Canal, the Straits of Hormuz, and Southeast Asia's Makala Straits. Such occurrences could become more common as ships get bigger and waterways get more congested. Oil companies are starting to prepare 
for the worst. On Wednesday, there was an uptick in interest from oil companies looking to book tankers with options to avoid the canal, according to a broker, and several bids for space on the pipelines that allow bypass of the waterway completely. For now, that's just a just-in-case move. Container ships will most likely have to wait it out, as the main alternative is the unattractive option of sailing around the southern tip of Africa. The disruption comes at the time when oil prices were already volatile. Crude oil surged to rough $70 a barrel earlier this month on Saudi production cuts, only to slump back to $60 this week due to setbacks in Europe's coronavirus vaccine program. Brent crude rose by more than 5% on Wednesday. Ever Given's crew are safe and accounted for, and there has been no reports of injuries or pollution, according to the ship's manager, Bernard Schultz, ship management. The vessel is carrying cargo for logistics camera Orient Overseas Container Line Limited, according to Mark Wong, a spokesman for OOCL. Now coming back to Australia, we know that the end of March marks a significant economic shift as JobKeeper and job seeker support ends, as does postpone interest and principal repayments on mortgages and even moratoriums on rental property evictions and rent rises. So there is much in play. There was an interesting perspective from Terry McCran, who argued that the problem with JobKeeper is not the companies got it and made a profit like Premier Investments and others did. He says the problem is the three-month gap between the initial JobKeeper commitment and the far more sober and measured policy responses. The payments were locked for six months in Australia, whereas in New Zealand it was just 12 weeks. And Australian businesses only had to have one bad month to get payments for six months, while the national lockdown was half that. This meant, he says, large swathes of businesses got a free handout of $1,500 per fortnight for most, if not all, employees through to the September quarter. At a macro level, this is why the GDP performance to December was so superior, and he argues that the $77 billion of the payments went to small and medium businesses, not the big guys. So if there has been monumental gouging, of the taxpayer, it's actually been mostly out of sight amongst smaller businesses. And remember, the big businesses needed to show a 50% drop in turnover, while small businesses only needed to show a 30% fall, and they only needed to do it for one month as well. Once again, it does raise questions about the design and implementation of the scheme, though of course it is now about to drop off in any case. That said, the federal government will announce economic support for the entertainment industry and make changes to the job maker hiring credit to help soak up job losses, which could be up to 150000 when JobKeeper ends. According to Senate estimates on Tuesday, Treasury officials revealed that JobMaker is drastically undersubscribed, with just 609 people in receipt of the job subsidy and an estimated 100,000 to 150,000 people are expected to lose their jobs when the general wage subsidy JobKeeper ends in a week. The finance minister Simon Birmingham sought to blame Labour for poor tape of JobMaker, arguing that its warnings that older workers could be sacked to hire younger staff contributed to businesses believing they might be attacked for accessing the program. Birmingham also revealed the government was very close to announcing a support package for the entertainment industry after warnings that revenues in the sector, such as live music, has not returned to pre-pandemic levels. The Treasury Secretary, Stephen Kennedy, told estimates that withdrawal of wage subsidies would probably lead to unemployment ticking back up, but it will also really have no impact on economic growth, which would normalise after two very strong quarters as the Australian economy recovered from its first recession in 30 years. Kenley said the department had recommended that JobKeeper end at the end of March, or else it would distort conditions in the labour market and prop up firms that were no longer viable. We are by no means pleased that there are businesses in difficult circumstances, Kennedy said in reference to the up to 150,000 people expected to lose their jobs, but this programme has done its work, frankly. Treasury officials revealed that despite 15,000 registrations of interest, just 609 young people had been hired through the job maker, which subsidises the wages of new hires under 35 who were previously on welfare, such as Job Seeker. The programme was originally estimated to cost $4 billion and support 450,000 jobs. More businesses accessing the scheme are micro businesses around 70%, with the rest small to medium businesses around 20%, not for profits 8% and just one person hired by a large business, earning more than 
$250 million. Berman said that with unemployment at 5.8%, the stronger employment outcomes reduced the likely demand for such a programme. Treasury officials said other causes for low uptake included firms waiting until they graduated from JobKeeper before applying and difficulty determining the eligibility of employees, such as how long they'd been on JobSeeker. Birmingham said to improve uptake, the government would emphasise that the programme was not a survival programme, but a youth employment programme, open to businesses making a profit. Jenny Wilkinson, the Deputy Secretary of the Fiscal Group, noted that Woolworths had chosen not to take part despite hiring young people because it felt it didn't need to. She said there were concerns expressed by large businesses about potential reputational risks for joining the programme. And Birmingham argued that Labour had claimed Australian businesses would lay off existing employees to hire people with a job maker credit and that, far from seeing that type of behaviour, we're not seeing the uptake. The way the opposition greeted and attacked his establishment and suggested those who would be using the programme would be undermining existing employees certainly did not help the reaction of businesses who perceived the programme was politically contested and charged, he said. We want to send a message to Australian businesses that the jobs created are additional jobs, so businesses should participate with confidence and should not be targeted or attacked for using this programme to hire more young Australians. But its shadow finance minister, Katie Gallagher, accused the government of trying to blame Labour for a flop programme. Birmingham said the government would reconsider the programme settings but committed not to change protections, he said, required businesses to maintain the job security of existing workers. He indicated the job maker would continue to be targeted at young people, citing unemployment levels at those aged 24 and under, at 3.8% lower than the pre-pandemic levels. Under questioning from the independent centre Rex Patrick about the plight of the entertainment industry and independent cinemas, Birmingham said the Communications and Arts Minister Paul Fletcher was considering the impact of the removal of JobKeeper on these sectors. Birmingham said Fletcher was very close to settling any adjustments to the types of support in these sectors. And elsewhere, Australia's unemployment rate will likely need to fall from 5.8% currently as far as the high threes for wages, growth and inflation to pick up, a senior central bank official said on Wednesday. Reserve Bank Deputy Governor Guy DeBell told a parliamentary committee he expected the country's labour market to continue to outpace expectations, though there was still a long way to go. What we do know is that a 5% unemployment rate won't generate much upward pressure on wages, DeBell told lawmakers in Canberra. And so, in all likelihood, it's a number lower than that. How much lower? We have an open mind on that, and we will just have to wait and see. But it would be great if the number was in the low fours or even in the high threes. Australia's job market has grown at a rapid clip in recent months, led by the country's success in curbing the coronavirus pandemic and solid monetary and fiscal stimulus. Data out last week showed employment surpassed all expectations to jump for a fifth consecutive month in February, while the jobless rate fell much more rapidly than expected. Together with a run of strong macroeconomic data in recent weeks, the RBA's lower for longer monetary policy pledge is perhaps being challenged. On Wednesday, DeBell reiterated that the Reserve Bank would keep the cash rate at a low record of 0.1% until actual inflation was sustainably within its 2-3% target band. The RBA does not expect that to occur until 2024, he added. The unemployment rate has come down faster than we had thought it would by this time, and we're hoping that trend will continue, that we continue to get surprised, DeBell said. We still think this recovery is going to be bumpy and uneven, and I don't think we are through the bumps and unevenness yet, so it may not be a straight line from here. And the Australian Secretary Stephen Kennedy and Reserve Bank of Australia Governor Phil Lowe are signalling the Morrison government can afford to set a more ambitious unemployment target before tightening budget spending too much. Treasurer Geoff Schreidenberg has pledged budget repair once the jobless rate is comfortably below 6%, which he then clarified was about 55 to 5.5%. Once the jobless rate falls to that point, the government plans to stabilise and ultimately reduce debt as a share of GDP, not necessarily in dollar terms, through ongoing fiscal discipline and reforms that boost economic growth. The jobless rate has already fallen much faster than anticipated to 5.8%, putting the unemployment goal within reach as soon as this year. Kennedy, the government's top economic advisor, said on Wednesday that Treasury's updated estimate 
of the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment, the NIRU, has fallen to around 4.5% from 5%. The NIRU is the estimated rate under which unemployment needs to fall for employers to bid up wages and for inflation to rise sustainably within the 2-3% target band. As emergency spending such as JobKeeper winds down, Kennedy suggests the government needs to be mindful in its strategies that the unemployment rate could go lower than in past decades before triggering inflation. In terms of the current fiscal settings, I think they're quite appropriate for driving growth. He said, in the years to come, we will see how low we get this employment rate too. The international evidence since the 2008 global financial crisis is that unemployment needs to fall much lower than previously thought before the labour market tightened and wages rose. He highlights his appearance at a Senate hearing on Wednesday follows the RBA revising its NARA estimate to about 4% and Governor Philip Lowe admitting at the Australian Financial Review Business Summit at this month that it's entirely possible that it would be 3%. The RBA will hold off increasing interest rates until that trigger point is reached. In contrast, the government's fiscal rule will have it tightening the budget considerably sooner. Econocrats are suggesting that it would be optimal if monetary and fiscal policy kept operating in tandem. Kennedy, a member of the RBA board, said the situation was different to previous downturns because the bank's overnight cash rate was anchored close to zero. Expansionary fiscal policy can help the economy reach full employment, enable the RBA to replenish its interest rate ammunition to fight the next recession. In the 2008 global financial crisis, the RBA was able to slash the cash rate by four percentage points. The RBA does not expect to increase the 0.1% cash rate until 2024. So if a big downturn hit in the next few years, it will be largely impotent beyond non-traditional tools. Concerns about asset price bubbles and potential financial instability from prolonged ultra-low interest rates amplify the push for fiscal policy to take some pressure off monetary policy. To be sure, the quality, not just the quantity, of government spending and economic reforms will also matter. The government faces an economic and political dilemma in considering its exit path from the timely, proportionate and targeted $250 billion dollar fiscal stimulus. Some $100 billion is still yet to flow into the economy, meaning there is still a strong pipeline of tax cuts and spending this year. On one hand, the government won't want to withdraw fiscal support too quickly because Scott Morrison and Frydenberg will want the economy firing as it approaches the next federal election, which is used to be held in the first half of next year. Fiscal consolidation has historically been done in the year after an election. On the other hand, Morrison and Frydenberg will want to be seen to be more fiscally prudent than the Labour Party and limit the shift towards inevitable bigger government after the COVID-19 pandemic. The wild card for the world economy is the potential inflationary impacts of the huge US fiscal stimulus of 1.9 trillion US dollars, to which President Joe Biden wants to add another 3 trillion for infrastructure and clean energy spending. The massive injections will test how long wages and inflation stay subdued. And meanwhile, Shane Wright in the SMH said the Federal Treasury and the Reserve Bank have very different views about the state of the economy and their disagreement could have real world ramifications for millions of Australians. Evidence from Treasury Secretary Stephen Kennedy on Wednesday confirmed the nation's two key arms of economic policy, fiscal and monetary, are on a collision course that could undermine how well they have dealt with the coronavirus recession. At the heart of the division is the concept of the Nairo. Nairo is the lowest level of unemployment before an economy starts to run hot, generating inflation and sharp wages growth. For organisations like the Treasury or the RBA, estimating Nairo is pivotal to their policy settings. And normally, those two pillars of Australian economic policy have the same estimate. Dr Kennedy revealed to a Senate committee that his department, the one that advises the government economic policy, reckons Nairo is somewhere between 45 and 5%. But just a fortnight ago, RBA Governor Philip Lowe entertained the case that this unemployment sweet spot could be below 4%. It's entirely possible none of us know, he said at the Australian Financial Review Conference. What I am sure of is that the unemployment rate needs to be below 5%. How far below 5 It's hard to tell. And I certainly hope it's not inconceivable that we could sustain an unemployment rate in Australia starting with a 3 Now, in percentage terms, they may sound pretty close, but in the real world, they are worlds apart. Household Finance Director with the Grattan Institute, Brendan Coates, estimates the difference 
Between the jobless rate of 4.5% and 3.5% is around 300,000 people in work. Not only does it mean far fewer people with an income, it would also mean less pressure on wages growth, which has been a major economic headwind since 2012. A big reason wages stagnated in the lead up to COVID was that unemployment in Australia was too high, he said. The jobless rate averaged 5.5% over the five years leading to COVID, higher than the level needed to spark greater competition among employers for workers and to drive up wages. If wages don't start growing again by 2024, as the Reserve Bank currently forecasts, we're talking about a lost decade as far as Australians' living standards are concerned. And as more people enter the workforce, they generate more demand, which in turn creates even more jobs and encourages extra people to look for work than a one percentage point drop in the unemployment rate would suggest. Treasurer Frydenberg said repeatedly he will begin budget repair when the jobless rate is comfortably below 6%, and most analysts think he's looking at around 5.5%. But the RBA, which already has official interest rates at 0.1%, while being in the middle of a $200 billion quantitative easing program, believes it needs a jobless rate of below 4% to get inflation and wages ticking up. It could ordinarily offset tighter fiscal policy with lower interest rates, but it can't do that anymore. The bank hasn't hit its inflation target since Tony Abbott was Prime Minister, while both it and Treasury have overestimated its way to grow since Julia Gillard was in power. The notion that fiscal policy could start being tightened to jobless rate of 5.5% while monetary policy is flat to the floor, trying to get unemployment down below 4%, is an economic disaster in the making. And that disaster would be felt in the hip pocket of millions of Australians. Now, a surge in house prices, as much as 17% nationally this year, is likely to spur the banking regulator into action, imposing lending curbs to cool the overheated market, according to ANZ. The bank has upgraded its forecasts of 9% growth nationally following a sharp rise in home prices since its November forecast. Property values in Sydney and Perth are forecast to jump by 19% each, while those in Melbourne and Brisbane are expected to climb by 16% and by 13% in Adelaide and 18% in Hobart. NZ forecast is one of the most bullish yet, eclipsing the predicted 8% rise nationally this year, which the CBA posted last month. CBA expects another 6% in 2022. Four months ago, NZ expected Sydney home prices to rise 8.8% in 2021, Perth 12%, Brisbane 9.5%, and Melbourne 7.8%. We've seen momentum really build up in the last couple of months with strong clearance rates across capitals and a real shortage of properties, particularly in Sydney, said ANZ senior economist Felicity Emmett. The strength in sentiment is putting upward pressure on prices with low stock levels adding to the fear of missing out sentiment emerging into the market. But the strong growth momentum is likely to fizzle towards the second half of the year, with fixed mortgage rates expected to rise, and the Australian Prudential Regular Authority like to intervene with macro prudential restrictions to cool prices, according to ANZ. ANZ is forecasting house prices to grow just 6% nationally over 2022, with Sydney, Melbourne, Hobart and Canberra rising by the same amount. Perth home prices are predicted to decline 9%, Brisbane 8% and Adelaide 5%. We think fixed mortgage rate rises will rise in the second half of the year due to the end of the term funding facility and the likelihood that the RBA chooses not to roll yield curve control, Ms Emmett said. So even without a lift in the cash rate, the housing market will face higher rates as early as the second half of 2021, with more significant tightening in 2023. As Emmett said, the strong price gains in recent months had raised the prospects of intervention by APRA. We're expecting the regulator to step in with macro prudential controls later this year, which could see price growth slow in 2022, she said. The exact measures likely will depend on how the market develops over the next six months, but we could see the regulator focusing on high debt-to-income loans and there's also a possibility that they could revert back to changing the buffers around mortgage serviceability. The prospect of lending curbs was put on the national radar earlier this month by the Council of Financial Regulators, which said it was monitoring the recent jump in house prices and would be ready to clamp down on property lending if banks took on too much risk. So once again, we see the banks spruiking ever higher house prices and the limited possibility of regulatory intervention from the regulators, it will happen, but probably not immediately. 
we just need to look over to New Zealand to see what happens when things get out of control. They are, of course, pretty much out of control in New Zealand, which is why the government over there acted yesterday. See my recent post. But frankly, things are out of control here too, with ultra low interest rates and massive amounts of incentives for people to go and buy into the property market, despite the fact that the risks are astronomical, debts are very high. And if you want more on that, look at my post yesterday where I looked in detail at recent developments in the housing market and some of the risks that we face. The fact is, I think that property prices will continue to move up in the short term. But the headwinds longer term are indeed very significant. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.